Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. There's a lot of news out there about the market, the housing market, prices, rents, all that. But we're going to dig through a bunch of it and talk about how we can see the trends to understand market metrics on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Stop for a moment. Why are you listening to this show? Are you dreaming of a bigger, brighter financial future? More personal freedom to live life on your own terms? What if there was just one skill that could make it happen? There is. Sales. Robert Kiyosaki says every entrepreneur must be good at sales. It's true for investors, too. Sales is how you attract money, people, and opportunities. Sales is the skill used to negotiate deals and lead your team. Sales skills are essential to success. The good news is, it's a learnable skill. The great news is, we've created a two-day interactive workshop to teach those skills to you. Make plans today to attend How to Win Funds and Influence People, Mastering the Art of Financial Selling. For dates and details, send an email to sales at realestateguysradio.com or visit realestateguysradio.com and look under events. Gain the skills you need to succeed. Email sales at realestateguysradio.com or look under the events tab at realestateguysradio.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio show. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me, as usual, our financial strategist and co-host, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. You know, we always talk about how all real estate is local. We can talk about the concepts of real estate uh, in general. And in fact, we have listeners in more than 190 countries, all of which, by the way, have real estate. And there's opportunities, perhaps, in many of those places for folks to invest in property. That's kind of our core message is that you're not making any more of it. Let's grab some real estate for all the great reasons it makes sense over the long haul. But every market is different. Every city is different within a city. Every neighborhood is different within a neighborhood. Different streets and different corners and all that is very different, which is one of the unique attributes of real estate compared to anything else you might invest in. Yeah, well, I mean, I spend a lot of time watching the news and every time real estate pops up into the mainstream financial news, I watch it because for two different reasons. One is I get ideas and they reveal things to me and they send me off on these rabbit hole chases, you know, where I uh, research things and I try to figure out if what they're saying makes sense or doesn't make sense, where'd they get the info, what's their interpretation, what's the reality. Uh, but they're filtering whatever they're looking through through their paradigm and they're writing to their audience. And this is one thing that you, I think everybody listening to this show needs to remember. When you're listening to somebody or reading somebody who's a mainstream financial journalist who spends most of the time talking to paper asset investors, people that are investing in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, uh, that are thinking about things in terms of what they see in the talking heads on television, real estate means something to them, but they look at it very differently than you. When we look at real estate, we obviously look at a much broader spectrum of real estate. There's all kinds of different niches, markets. Uh, and when I say markets, I don't just mean geographic markets. There's different demographic markets or different product niches or different uh, nations. And so there's, there's a lot. And then when these guys start getting into analyzing trends and looking at numbers and metrics and trying to say what's going on in the asset class of real estate, longtime listeners know that we can't stand it when people call real estate an asset class because it's not. It's just... It, Every deal is unique. Every ownership is unique. Every property is unique. Every neighborhood, local economy is unique. And in that regard, real estate is unlike any other kind of investment out there. And there's a lot of other reasons why real estate is unique. But, but that's one of the most unique things um, is understanding that, that every deal is its, its own animal. And so when you look at some of this stuff, you got to dig a little bit deeper and then you have to walk away with maybe the lesson, the bigger picture trend to try to figure out what's on the horizon that may roll into your neighborhood. Uh, are you going to have positive energy, if you will, coming into your market or leaving uh, people, jobs, economic activity and all of that? And then that way you can begin to dig down into the street level of what's going on in your particular market and decide what moves you want to make. The great news is, is that if you are proactive uh, you don't have to be, you know, the flash. You don't have to move at lightning speed uh, to be ahead of most of the people who don't find out until it's on them. Yeah, because all real estate is local, meaning you're going to purchase a property in a neighborhood, in a city, in a county, in a state, because that's what you're going to do. You can choose to just throw a dart at the map and find a place 
Or you can study the markets, market analysis. You can study the trends, what's happening with these things. Now, the rub is most of the information we get, and you alluded to this, Russ, but just to make it crystal clear, most of the information that we get and read about real estate is not local. It's the national housing news. It's this state's median home price or this city's median home price. And so how does that relate to you as a real estate investor? And that's really what we want to break down today for you is you want to be watching the horizon, you want to be paying attention, and then you always have to ask, now what does that mean to me? For instance, NAR, the National Association of Realtors, is the largest trade association with um, over a million members and their chief economist, uh, Dr. Lawrence Yoon has been on our show before. Uh, his job is to look out ahead at the horizon and see what's happening in the world of real estate and prices and uh, activity and all that and to make some sense out of it. And so NAR, NAR, publishes a lot of information. They just put out an article April 22nd, 2019 that said, existing home sales slide 4.9% in March. So if that's all you knew, existing home sales slide 4.9% in March, you might think, uh-oh, oh no, that's bad, sales are down. Well, it is saying that sales are down, but is it talking about the price? Is it talking about the number of sales? Well, when they say existing home sales, first of all, they're only talking about single-family homes, not duplexes, not apartments, not commercial property, just homes, and they're talking about existing home sales, meaning resales. Somebody already bought the house and they put it on the open market to sell. By the way, probably doesn't include for sale by owner transactions. Sometimes it can, depending on where they get their information, but usually NAR is going to come from realtor-represented transactions. And that's a minor point because realtors represent most transactions, but it's still the point that not every bit of data makes it into the headline. Now imagine that right next to that, and this isn't true, but imagine right next to that was an article that said new home sale prices are up 4.9% in March. Well, those aren't the same number of sales, but if they were... That would say that overall we had the same number of sales. There were more for new homes and less for existing. And I bring that example up because you've got to think about whatever the other side of the equation is. I saw a chart the other day that came out on real estate that somebody sent me, and here's what it says. Year over year, home price growth, follow me on this, home price growth flattens nationwide in March. Okay, this came out in April as well on Redfin. So... If you look at the chart, you see a red line that is going down, talking about price. But the price isn't actually going down. What's gone down is the home price growth. So often when we present and we do charts and graphs, what the real estate guys do from time to time at events, we point out these kinds of things. Like if you just look at this chart, it says, oh no, it's going down. But what's going down is not the price. The price actually went up. In fact, NAR points out that for the last 85 months in a row, the median home price across the country has gone up. 85 months in a row. This point that Redfin is making is that the rate at which the price is increasing is not growing as fast. That might be obvious to you, but to so many folks, it's not. It, it makes me think about the way the uh, Congress talks about cutting the budget, you know, so we're going to cut the rate at which the budget grows. Yeah. <laughs> but, exactly. you know, ult ultimately, I think, Robert, the point that we're trying to make, and maybe we're beating it hard, but it's so easy to have your attitude and your um, idea of what is possible or what's going on in the market jaded by some of these headlines that are designed to create fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They get you to buy the newspaper, they get you to read the article, they get you to click whatever it is they want you to do. And again, when you're looking at these types of statistics, they don't really mean anything. I mean, not in the real world, because if you think about it, if you've got a, one market on one side of the country that is just rip-roaring, it's grown by 50%, and then you've got a market on the other side of the country that has declined by 50%, and you put them in a blender, you say on average the market is stable. 
Well, it's not stable if you're in either one of those individual markets because you're either ex experiencing huge loss of equity or huge equity gains. And this is the whole point about just understanding that markets are different. And so when, especially when it comes to real estate, it's not a commodity. It's not like a share of gold or a barrel of oil or a share of stock like Apple or whatever, because every share is the same price at the same day around the world. That is like a commodity. But real estate's not a commodity. So these things are interesting to kind of illustrate economic trends at the macro level, but you can't trade or do business or make investment decisions based on that macro stuff. It's just the beginning of the exploration, and that's really what we're talking about. Yeah, and it's a paradigm we're trying to break. You know, most folks, you sit down, and if they know anything about investment property, they're going to have a model for what a, the economic outcome of a property would be, and they're going to say, well, here's your, you know, rent, your your projected monthly rent, and then we're going to have a, a vacancy factor. And if you were to poll 100 of those folks, probably 95% of them would put 5% in as their vacancy. You know it. You looked at these performers. There's always a 5% vacancy factor. Well, first of all, rarely, if ever, is a vacancy factor in a market actually 5.0%. But even if it is, what does that mean? If you want a single family house, is it possible for it to be 95% occupied? Well, probably not. If the market is 95% occupied, that tells you something about the health of the market, especially if you know what it used to be. But your house is either 100% occupied or 0% occupied. So knowing 95%, people go, okay, well, it's 95% occupied. That means I can feel good about a continuous stream of tenants. Maybe, unless last year's number was 99%. And the forecast is next year's 89%. So that's why we study all these things. And in an hour show, there's no way we can talk about every single metric that we look at. But we want to get to some of the core metrics because we are seeing markets change. And we are at a turn. Now, whether or not this turn means, oh, my gosh, the market's at the top or, or hey, there's a lot more room to go. That's not what we're saying. Unfortunately, our crystal ball cut out on us and doesn't work and hasn't for many years. But what we do know is that we can spot some of these trends that we're alluding to if we pay attention. So, Robert, in the same article, and maybe you can comment on this because you and your dad have such a long history in residential property brokerage, but it talks about properties remaining on the market for an average of 36 days in March, down from 44 days in February, but up from 30 days a year ago. So it doesn't really matter what the numbers are, maybe what the trend is, but for that newbie real estate investor who's out there looking at a market, trying to figure out, is this a seller's market? Is this a buyer's market? Is it showing strength or is it showing weakness? What did days on market really mean? You know, that is such a good point. It is one of the many metrics we actually look at, average days on market. Now, I'll tell you something. When people look at those numbers, depending on where they're from, if they're from the Bay Area, for instance, they may think, well, gosh, 30 days on the market, that's forever. If they're from Kansas, that could be the fastest sale ever. Across the country, average time on the market for a piece of property to transact is typically between five and seven months. Now, there's a market like right now, San Jose, California, average days on the market, 16. And that is up from eight two months ago. So it's all, like we said, all real estate is local. But the point is a good one. If we see that the number of days on the market is going down, then you might assume from that that it means houses are selling quickly. And that can be, but there's more to it. That's one point on the curve. And we want to learn today that there's lots of points we have to consider before we can jump to a conclusion. Imagine that fewer people were listing their homes. And so there's just fewer houses that are available. Well, then if the number of buyers is about the same, the average number of days on the market is going to go down because they're snapping up the houses that come on the market. If there's three buyers for every seller, they're going to transact faster. If there's three sellers for every one buyer, then those homes are going to languish on the market. We're going to see higher days on the market. Now, what they try to do in all these statistics is have a meaningful amount of transactions. If we're talking about the transactions on your street, it's hard to say, well, the median price went up or down. It's not enough information. And let's talk about the, the metrics that we use. You'll hear the news pundits talk about average home price. They'll say median home price. These things have different meanings. The, the median, and probably this is most of you understand this, is the one in the middle of a list of 100 sales that happened last month, the one that was right there in the middle. Well, maybe it has to be 101 to have one in the middle. Uh, that's the median price. 
and we were talking about this before the show, actually. If you, uh, let's say that you have uh, the numbers two, five, and seven. The median is five. Now, if your numbers were two, five, and 14, the median is still five. So the median price isn't the same as the average price. And so depending on what information you're after, you're gonna use those types of metrics. It's that way with occupancy and vacancy. If I look at enough of a subset of a marketplace, if I'm looking at 10,000 apartments, for instance, and I have data on their occupancy, that's gonna be meaningful. The occupancy on my street, not as meaningful. But since all real estate is local, it's more important. But to get to a good amount of information, you need a big statistical set, and that's why most of the stuff that you read is going to be a bigger group of properties than really affect your market and your property. We have lots more to share with you. It's time to take a break. When we come back, more from The Real Estate Guys. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. It's Robert Helms. Thanks so much for listening to the show today. I want to personally invite you to come see an amazing real estate market that combines excellent cash flow, offshore diversification, and what we affectionately call lifestyle investing. Come join me from July 5th to 8th in the beautiful country of Belize. The Real Estate Guys have been bringing investors to Belize for more than 13 years now, and our discovery trip is designed to show you the market like nobody else can. Sure, Belize is breathtakingly beautiful. The people are wonderful. And wait till you taste the food. But the real opportunity is the real estate investment potential. 2018 was the biggest year in tourism Belize has ever witnessed, and this year is starting off strong. How does that translate to real estate investment? That's what you have to come see. There's all types of opportunity in Belize when it comes to real estate, including both long-term and short-term rentals, commercial and retail triple net properties, business opportunities, land acquisition, development, agriculture, and more. And as the only country in Latin America with English as its official language, it's easy to understand the law. Property rights are strong and contracts are in English. And in Ambergris Key, a unique situation exists where demand for rentals continues to outstrip supply, creating a compelling environment for investors. So come see for yourself. Join me July 5th through 8th in Ambergris Key, Belize, as we study the market, learn about the sustainable drivers, and tour lots of beautiful real estate. And like all of our field trips, there are no properties for sale during the weekend. Rather, you'll meet lots of local providers that will help educate you about the market so you can follow up with them after the trip if the market's interesting to you. But that ball's in your court. You'll receive their contact details, but they won't receive yours unless you give it to them. You've heard about Belize and the Real Estate Guys for all these years. Now come see what all the excitement is about. Plus, we'll have lots of time over meals and activities to talk about all things real estate. To get the details, go to the website at realestateguysradio.com and click on events where you'll find the Belize Discovery Trips. Once you register, you'll get information about our group hotel rates as well as travel details. So join me in Belize July 5th through 8th. It's a beautiful country with lots of amazing possibilities and the only thing missing is you. Go to realestateguysradio.com under events. I look forward to seeing you in beautiful Belize. Hey, I'm Jim Grant. I uh, am the editor and uh, indeed the founder of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. And you, ladies and gentlemen, you lucky people, are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show today. However you listen, tell a friend about The Real Estate Guys in our 22nd year of broadcast. We're talking today about spotting trends and really understanding market metrics. There's a lot of news about housing, but sometimes it doesn't all relate to us. And if it does, we just have to read through kind of the national headlines to understand what does this mean to me. You know, Russ, you sent me an article about a particular real estate market that has added a million people to their market in 10 years. So before we talk about the market, just think about that. If we know that people are moving in and out of different places, some cities, some towns, some counties are gaining residents every month, some are losing. So we focus on something called net in migration. At the end of the day, when we net out how many people moved in, how many people moved out, we're looking for net 
in migration, meaning a market where more people are entering than leaving. If more people are entering than leaving, there's going to be more demand. Demand for schools, demand for services, demand for shopping, demand for housing, demand for all things real estate. If people are leaving and there's less people for the available goods and services, then we can expect demand and prices and everything else to go down. So that's pretty rudimentary. And it's not enough information to act on, but it's one of the things we study. So when we hear a market gains more people than any other market over an eight-year period, then that's probably going to get your attention. Now, it turns out this particular market is a market that we were taking students to more than 10 years ago for many, many years, pointing to this market saying, hey, this market seems strong. Hey, it looks like a lot of things are working in its favor. A lot of the trends and many more uh, that we're talking about today that we take a look at when we do market analysis. And nothing makes us right until hindsight. And in hindsight, I can't think we could have picked much of a better market than Dallas, Texas. It, it worked out great. And, and and so what happened is the world changed as far as real estate is concerned during the great financial crisis. And so we had a really good run prior to the crisis going into red hot markets, capturing big equity gains, typically going into the number one appreciating market a year or two before it appreciated, getting in position of riding that equity wave. As long as the fresh credit was pouring into the system, it was all good. Well, in 2008, when the credit markets blew up, it was a complete reset in the mortgage industry. Uh, it flushed a lot of those excesses out. And, you know, I've been pretty candid about what happened to me in that space. And it forced you to look at things a little bit differently. And the first thing we did is we started listening to smart people. And so we had three different people with three different perspectives, all talking to us about Dallas and the DFW market. And prior to the run-up, Dallas had been one of the most boring markets there was, like the least appreciation, just super, super boring. But you know, when the world blows up in your face, all of a sudden stable looks real attractive. But it was deeper than that. It was a combination of affordability, low income tax, a vibrant infrastructure and diverse economy. But the biggie was energy and that energy was one of the few remaining industries that remained pretty solid after 2008. And so that was kind of what we went looking for is the economic activity that started the discussion. Once we got there and we started really studying the market, we began to realize compared to many other markets that we'd been in, and this was back in the day when we were doing field trips all over the country, we recognized, we thought, wow, this, this market's going to be the hottest market. So we put a lot of time and attention. You go back and listen to the archives, you know, going back the last 10 years, a lot of talk about Dallas, field trips to Dallas, people that we were aligned with in Dallas. And now here we are 10 years later, a million plus people, that's like the entire population of San Jose, California, landing in DFW. And San Jose is like a top 12 metro all by itself. Well, in fact, this article, which came out of the Dallas News, says that, it says, well, it starts with Dallas-Fort Worth has gained more new residents than any other metropolitan area in the country, adding more than a million people in an eight-year period. And the region's population now tops 7.5 million. It was substantially less than that, just over six when we were doing those trips, solidifying North Texas's ranking as the the nation's fourth largest metro area. So there's three larger metro areas than Dallas-Fort Worth, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. But each of those markets are losing residents. It's net out migration. At the end of every month, at the end of every year, more people are leaving than coming. So that draws a distinction as well. If that trend were to continue, then what's going to happen in that list? Pretty soon, number four is going to be number three and number two, and you know how math works. Again, this isn't enough information to go on, but it were many of the things we were looking at back then. And I'll tell you, we had a challenge understanding it because for so long, Dallas-Fort Worth was number 48 or 49 in a price appreciation. And we're like, well, what's exciting about that? Well, it's changed, and that's the whole thing about being able to spot a change. Just because something has always been a certain way does not mean it always will be a certain way. You know, I was listening to some 8-track tapes the other day, and it reminded me of the fact that things change all the time. Well, I, and I think the other thing is there's lessons in this, because what it is that makes Texas attractive, and what is it that apparently is making New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago unattractive. In fact, Illinois has lost more population than any other state for four straight years. So you have to ask yourself, what's going on in Illinois that's pulling people out? Some people say, oh, it's people from the Northeast wanting to move to the warm weather. Well, LA is pretty warm. 
So it's not just weather. There's something going on in California. And so, you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to start to look at this and realize that you've got the cost of living, you've got the tax burden, you have now with the new tax code, the change in the state and local tax uh, deductions. And so higher tax states are going to be losing to no tax states. That's something we've been talking about for a long time. Now, the reason we keep bringing these things up is not to hear ourselves talk, but because it's easy to fall asleep at the wheel. It's easy because real estate really does move slowly. You really do have time to get in position. You have time to study a market, to build relationships, to get to know it, to dig deep into a neighborhood, to get your finances in order to go raise money if you're going to have investors with you. Whatever it is you need to do, and you don't miss the opportunity because it isn't like, boom, the idea hits the marketplace, everybody gets in position who's well positioned, and then tomorrow it's over and you missed it. It's not like that. You can you can spend three, four, five years buying buying into or investing into a trend if you see it, but you have to come up every once in a while and take a look. And when we see headlines like this, it's like there's so much stuff going on right now. We feel like there's a little bit of a, a, a wind of change blowing in the, in the market, especially in the housing market. And we thought it was worthy of your attention. So we wanted to bring it up and talk a little bit about things we've learned in the past, a little bit about what we see right now, and maybe just a tad about where we see some of the things happening in the future. And that's really what's important is trying to figure out where it's going. We we can all look at the past and have pretty good clarity about it. And we act in the present based on what we've learned in the past. But there is a little bit of that forward looking. And again, you know, you probably heard our prediction show at the beginning of the year. Every the start of the new year, we try to do one or two shows on predictions of what the experts are saying. And, you know, at the end of the year, you know whether or not the predictions were true. <laughs> but that's the thing about hindsight. Looking forward, we have to take our best educated guess based on where we hear the market now. So I'm going to guess that in the last couple of months, you've heard a lot of headlines about market movement, whether it's because your area is at an all-time high in terms of median price or an all-time a short number of days on the market or slowing down like crazy. You know, I have a great friend who's just put her house on the market, and part of the reason she's done it is the area she lives in has gone up in value by about 40% in the last two and a half years. And she wasn't really planning on moving now, but she's got a lot of equity in her house, and she said, gosh, what do you think? And I said, well... You know, if you could move and capture that equity right now, of all the times to do that, I don't have a crystal ball, but I'm going to err on the side of saying, get out while the getting is good. Could that house go up another 40% in the next two and a half years? Possibly. But because of the market it's in, I started to read some of the tea leaves, which included the fact that price escalation was slowing, number of days on market was increasing, multiple offer bids were down, right? So those are all different points on the curb. Now, I'm not licensed to sell real estate anymore. I'm not listing her house. But as a friend for 30 years, she reached out and said, what do you think? And my caveat as well, it's just my opinion, but here's what I think and here's why. Now, what's interesting is in this article, uh, information that came out from um, NAR, they were also talking about where some of the existing home prices fell the most, and they break it down by region. So if we say, you know, nationally it's this number, well, what NAR often does is not break it down by neighborhood, but by region. So they said, for instance, existing home prices in the Northeast decreased 2.9%, in the Midwest, they declined 7.9%, in the South, 3.4%, and in the West, 6%. So each of those regions were a little different. Now imagine you broke it down by state, or by county, or by city. Before you know, there's the difference that makes up those local markets that we keep talking about. So you do want to pay attention, I think. I wouldn't say that it's meaningless if we're watching what the national home averages are doing, but it's not enough information. You have to take that and say, hey, am I in one of those areas that's likely to be hit because jobs are in question or because affordability is on the table, right? Am I going to be hit because of that? Is my market going to react to that? Many of us own properties that are rental properties in areas where a $25 increase in the rent charged will force the tenant to move. Now, most of us who are listening to the program wouldn't move if our mortgage went up $25 or if our rent went up $25, it would be inconsequential. But for many of our tenants, it's not. 
And so when you see information about that, you know, Russ, we've talked over the years about the gasoline prices and really the price of oil and gas, and that's kind of a bigger discussion. But one of the discussions that always happens around that topic is what does it mean at the pump because your tenants are affected by what happens at the pump more than you are. Yeah, for sure. Because energy is a key input, cost input to really every product that anybody consumes. And when you are uh, a renter, a renting class person, typically, and again, you know, you always have to paint in broad brushes, but it's not somebody who has a lot of investments or a lot of savings or living paycheck to paycheck. And when most of your money is going to living expenses and those living expenses are going up, then that makes it harder for you to absorb rent increases. It makes it harder for you uh, to be able to go out and save to buy a home of your own. It keeps you in the renting class. And the challenge that you've got, and again, this is another trend that we've been talking about for years here uh, since the financial crisis, and even in the midst of this recovery, if you will, uh, the reality is it's still hard for working class people, renting class people, uh, to save money. And I think the stats bear that out. So when you understand that, if you are at the top of the market in terms of the price point of your rent, if you're at the top of the market in terms of your product niche and the type of product like an A property, and if you're in a market that's kind of tops in a geographic region, then you can bet that when things get soft, people are going to move down because they can, and nobody's going to be moving in because you're already at the top. And so I personally think it's a, probably a little bit more prudent to be a little bit more in the middle. And we talk about that because when, when people get squeezed, they will move. And whether it's $25 a month rent increase or whether it's I'm going to move to get away from high income tax or whether I'm going to move to have lower cost of living and still have a good quality of life, uh, people are going to be in to make those moves. And when you look at these macro uh, migration trends, you can see it happening and it's not hard to predict. Uh, and then, of course, that's not enough to act on, but it gives you an area, a region, a metro that you can begin to focus on. And then once you decide you really like the, the macros of that metro, then you have to dig down and get your boots on the ground team and, and work with the people, the agents and the property managers and the people at the street level who are going to help you understand where the pockets of opportunity is. Because even when you get down to uh, a sub area of a major metro, like a little area that, you know, they have their different names, whatever they get called, you know, when you you live in an area, you know that, that everybody calls it, you know, Phoenix, but there's all these other little pockets and you identify what those are. Even within those, there are neighborhoods on one side of what Victor Benash calls the line and others on the other side of the line. And you want to make sure that you're on the right part of that. And the people who can tell you where the line is moving, where the trends are, where the demand is, and put you in that sweet spot where you have people above you and people below you. So whether it's good or bad, you're going to get pressure demand pressure, that can be a little bit safer to play. But but you, it all starts looking at the macro and then drilling down and, and, and getting the boots on the ground team to fill in the gaps. Because you can't get good stats when you get right down to the neighborhood. I mean, that's where you have to start looking at listings and days on market and multiple offers and all the kind of stuff Robert's been talking about. You know, we do all this testing of reality, we call it, when we go to a market. We hear something like, oh, in this market, such and such is happening. Then we go meet with a property manager who's managing 800 houses in that market at that time. And we say, well, we've heard this and we've heard that. Is it true? And they'll say, well, that's true on the other side of the river, but not here. Okay, well, or that's true downtown, but not out here in the suburbs. Or we'll ask, you know, hey, what are, what's happening in your market? Are you seeing multiple offers? I'll say, oh my gosh, in the last three weeks, it's amazing what's happened. We're seeing people come out of the woodwork. Okay, you're never going to read that in a headline. That's the kind of stuff you have to get locally. And they say the trend is your friend. We'll talk more about spotting the trends when we come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. Memphis is famous for being the home of the king of rock and roll, but it's also the king of cash flow. If you're looking for affordable cash flow properties, it's hard to beat Memphis. Get your portfolio rocking and more cash flowing your way by calling Terry Kerr at Mid South Home Buyers. Terry's the king of turnkey properties. Contact Terry through the resource section at realestateguysradio.com. And be sure to order Terry's tips for turnkey rental property investing report. It's free. Just send your request to turnkey at realestateguysradio.com. Are you looking to create sustainable wealth through agricultural real estate? 
then look no further than Agro Nosotros. They're a sustainable specialty agriculture company with specialty coffee farming operations in Panama and fine flavor organic chocolate operations in Belize. Over the last four years, they've helped ordinary people to diversify outside of traditional real estate and into offshore agricultural real estate. They don't have your typical tenants, termites, and troubles. Their tenants are trees, and they grow and produce two hugely popular and proven products, coffee and chocolate. Through Agro Nosotros, you can own half-acre parcels in your very own specialty coffee or organic cacao farm, turnkey managed on your behalf, that produce passive cash flow for you and your heirs. And you can feel good about where you put your money to work. Agro Nosotros has socially sustainable programs that provide living wages, improved accommodations, and a steady channel to market to literally hundreds of farmers. And so far, they've placed 61 kids in school. To find out more and see how you can get involved, email agro at realestateguysradio.com. That's agro, A-G-R-O, at realestateguysradio.com. Hi, this is Chris Martinson, author of Prosper, and you are listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. You know, before any commerce happens, someone has to learn how to sell something. If you'd like to sell more or just get better at influence and persuasion, then you need to come on out to How to Win Funds and Influence People. It happens the last weekend in June in Dallas, Texas. All the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com under events. We're talking today about how we can spot trends and understand market metrics. Before we get back to that discussion, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia. That's your chance to win a prize by knowing something about uh, real estate. And uh, it's kind of a fun question today. As soon as you hear it and think you know the answer, what you're going to do is get to your favorite email browser and send an email to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name your mailing address, and the answer to the question. And if you're the first one with the right answer, you're going to get a cool book called Life-Defining Moments from Bold Thought Leaders, a collection of awesome stories that you're going to dig. That could be yours. If you know today's real estate trivia question, last week it was Ask the Guys, and we had a bunch of great questions. In fact, we're looking for more because we've got another Ask the Guys episode brewing. So you can find out the details on that at realestateguysradio.com. Here's what we asked. Where is the magic capital of the world? Well, the state of Michigan is the magic capital of the world. It has a magic museum. It hosts an annual magic convention. And its Colon Lakeside Cemetery has more magicians buried in it than any other cemetery in the world. Abracadabra. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. The television show Full House. Well, I can stop right there. It's already a real estate trivia question. See how I did that? The television show Full House ran for eight seasons with the Tanner family becoming a TV staple. Now it's actually going to become more of a real estate trivia question because here's the question. Where in the world is the actual house that was used for all the exterior shots on the show? So when you saw the Full House, where is that house? It's an actual house. By the way, it sold about four years ago for nearly $4 million. But that's besides the point. Maybe it's a clue. Where in the world is the Full House house? If you know or just want to take a guess, send your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name, mailing address, and the answer to the question. And you could be the lucky recipient of life-defining moments from bold thought leaders. That's today's real estate trivia question. As real estate investors, we want to be able to see in advance what's happening in the market. We can do that by studying the current and the past. And we're talking today about how we can use the metrics and what we're learning about markets to help kind of guide our decision making. Big picture is we want to be in markets that are going to produce good income and increases in value, equity growth over time. And by studying the markets and finding out are more people going there, are rents going up, are they going down, what's the average days on markets, who's investing, what kinds of properties are, are the best for tenants, all that stuff, we're going to figure out a better than average bet. If all you did was bought a house somewhere every year for the next 20 years, now you own 20 houses, well, maybe you'll do okay. But if you're strategic about it, you can do a lot better. And so there's a lot of different metrics that we look at. And let's get specific, if we can, about some marketplaces. So again, depending on when you're listening to the show, if it's if it's current that you're listening to it or you're hearing it on the radio, well, then this is kind of right now. We've been talking about this premise that nationwide there are numbers and trends, but then we have to break it down. So right now, there are some markets where year-over-year -year sales, that's the number of sales, are going up. Some of the top markets, 
Baltimore, Maryland, Memphis, Tennessee, Tampa, Florida. Okay, that's where we're seeing big increases in year-over-year -year sales. Now, on the other side, there are some areas, and by the way, those were like 20%, 24%, 34% in Baltimore. That's a big increase in sales. At the same exact time, there are markets that are down 19%, like Los Angeles, 18% like Las Vegas, 16% like Fresno, California, or 15% like Seattle, Washington. Now, that's just in year-over-year -year sales from March of 2019, the last month for which there is data at the moment, and March of 2018. But is that enough information? Probably not, but it's a point on the curb. What if we knew about the direction of the median home price? Now, again, because median is the one in the middle of the list, you got to be a little careful with median. People read more into median than is actually there. If one week we have 80 sales and the next week we have 120 sales and one group of those sales is because a new home builder just released a whole bunch of new inventory at a clearance price, then that's going to affect the median perhaps. I remember when we both lived in the Bay Area, Russ, there was a local newspaper that every single Sunday did a color-coded map in the real estate section about median home price. And it was literally for the week. And as I studied that week after week after week, it occurred to me very visually that a week is too short of a period of time to make any meaningful information on median home price. Because one week, say Los Gatos, had gone up by 2.1%. And the next week, it had gone down by 11.8% in median price. And it's because of something we hit on earlier. The, the number, the statistical number of, of units being used wasn't high enough to give meaningful information. So that's why when you see trends, it's usually for bigger MSAs, metropolitan statistical areas, sometimes bigger than a city, sometimes several cities. So if we look at median home price and we look at sales, we can get some clues into a market. If the price is going up and the sales numbers are going down, that's a very different market than if those two things are flipped. Now, can the median price be going up while the number of sales is going up? Yeah, that's a strong market. Can the median price be going down as the number of sales is going down? Yeah, that's a weaker market. But you only can tell in context, meaning it's compared to what, which is why they will often talk about year over year or month over month. Because in just today's number, it doesn't give you the context to understand the direction it's moving. And ultimately, it all comes down to context. And I think, you know, you can look at all this data. I think a couple of things I just want to say. One is when you're listening to all of this stuff and you're reading all this news and you're trying to understand how to think about it, I have found that if you just stay very, very focused on a very simple concept, supply, demand, and capacity to pay. And then when you break that down and you understand what your inputs are, uh, so supply would be amount of inventory, existing inventory that's in the market. Uh, it would be the capacity of the market to expand its supply. Uh, it could be other factors, the ability of the market to be able to expand. Uh, obviously, you know, Omaha, Nebraska is a very different market in terms of its ability to expand supply compared to Manhattan or San Francisco, where everything that possibly could be developed has been developed. So when you understand the supply side, on the demand side, and we break out capacity to pay just the demand side that's a lot of times it's just people but it's the demographics of the people so we talked about migration people coming in migration people moving out and you have to look at the demographic of the people coming in what type of product type are they interested in and you know people who look at this and study it realizes that that families have different requirements than young people have different requirements than retired people those are different. And of course, that's just in residential uh, because then, of course, you have businesses and what their requirements are. And sometimes that's proximity to other geographic things. But demand is people wanting to buy. Wanting is interesting, but the other part of it is capacity to pay. That's where we pay attention to things like wages, taxes, uh, inflation, cost of living. And that's why energy is so important. And then interest rates on mortgages, because most people are going to use financing. And so when you kind of understand what your basic inputs are, then you realize when you're reading these headlines, you're not looking to the headlines and the statistics for answers. You're at looking at them for 
clues about how to ask better questions and then go in and analyze what's going in in the market based on breaking down supply, demand, and capacity to pay and those components. And it's a little bit complicated, but I, I, I bet you probably whatever you do professionally, you know, if you're an engineer, a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, probably whatever you do, computer programmer, whatever you do professionally, probably far more complicated than this. The challenge is nobody ever really teaches you how to look at it. But I find that if I have the context, kind of the buckets where to put the data, and I understand I'm not looking for answers, I'm looking for questions, it makes processing all the data a lot easier. And then it starts to take me on a, it's like solving a puzzle. I, it, it, I begin to peel back the layers of the onion and see, okay, here's, here's a hypothesis. This is what I think is happening. Can I verify that or, just, or do I get some evidence from somebody who's qualified to have an opinion? And that's why talking to people who have boots on the ground, because when you're looking at stats, you're looking at the rear view mirror that isn't telling you what's going on right now. When you have what happened in the past and what's happening now, you have two points on the curve that can begin to maybe show you a little bit of a trend for what might be coming around the corner. So hopefully somebody out there found that was useful, but that's how I process all this information to have it make sense to me. Well, I think the framework of the puzzle makes a lot of sense because everything that you read or learn or study or hear from local practitioners is just a piece of the puzzle. And you put all that together to decide, okay, based on that, what do I think? Do I think this is a time to increase my holdings? Is this a time to reposition what I have? Is this a time to consider a new market? If so, which one or which ones? Or, right, those are all the decisions you have to make. We've got more. We're going to come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Live nationwide, you're listening to the Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Hungry for more real estate investing ideas? Here's two steps you can take today. First, go to realestateguysradio.com and sign up for our weekly newsletter. You'll get access to a continuous feed of thought-provoking commentary specifically for real estate investors while also focusing on broader picture economics. Then, once you're at our site, look for the Resources tab where you'll find our amazing collection of special reports. Browse dozens of white papers, webinars, and market reports and request the ones that appeal to you. What are you waiting for? Head to realestateguysradio.com to implement education for effective action. Hi, this is Sam Freshman, author of Principles of Real Estate Syndication, and you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks so much for tuning into the show. We've got the date set for the 2020 Investor Summit at Sea. It's more than a year away, but that doesn't mean you can't get on the advance notice list. You want to be first to hear when we open up registration, and all you have to do is go to realestateguysradio.com and click Summit and see, get on our advanced notice list. We already have more than 130 people signed up. Well, how can that be if we're not even open for registration? Those are folks who came this year and said, I am coming back no matter what. Well over half the people have already secured their cabins. That should tell you something. So get on the list. It's no obligation. Just let you know when we open up registration. We're talking today about trends, market trends, the metrics we use, how we look at markets, and taking all that information and assembling it in a way that makes sense for you. Now, one more point I want to bring up as you're reading and looking at this stuff. Not everybody uses the same sources of information. I alluded to that before when I have for sale by owners out there is information sometimes people use, sometimes don't. they don't, right? Here's another big one. I, I mentioned earlier, I think, that for 85 months in a row, median home price of existing home sales has gone up according to the National Association of Realtors. Now, there's another article where it just says this is the first time in nearly six years that median home price has gone down. 
And according to this article, median home price went down year over year 0.1%. Well, wait a minute. We just said that median home price went up. Here, median home price went down. What's the difference? That's what you have to figure out. I'm going to tell you the answer so it stimulates your thinking. The NAR numbers were existing home sales. This median home price metric includes new and existing homes. So when they break it down, they say, well, of existing homes for sale, they're actually up 3.6% in median sales price. But for new listings, they're down 2.8%. And when you put all that in the blender, based on the prices across the board and where new fall with existing, well, then median home price is down a little bit, just a tenth of a percent. So is a tenth of a percent sound the alarms? Well, imagine the distinction here. Existing home prices, median home price, are up, but new home sales are down. Well, who sells existing homes? All kinds of different owners, corporate owners, moms and pops, investors. Who sells new homes? There's only one category. Developers, builders. Who's more likely to discount and less emotionally attached to the price? Well, new home builders, if they need to make room for inventory, if they see interest rates are changing, if they've got to have capital to go acquire their next piece of property, they'll put out a sale for two weeks. And I'm not saying that's what happened, but that can happen because builders think like business owners. And most single-family homes are not owned by people listening to this show, investors. They're owned by people that live in them who want to get their price and can be patient and so on. So the point is you can't draw a a rock-solid conclusion from any information you see. And I think we've beat that horse, but the whole concept is you're looking at what the trend is. There's a lot of great places you can go monthly, like NAR. They publish great data, but there's other sources as well, where every month you can see. If you start looking at these numbers every month, you're going to get that feel. You're going to get that intuitive part of the market that goes, okay, I kind of get where it's going. You know who's always really in tune with the market? An active buyer. An active buyer in the market. Think about when you bought your last house. You got into the market. You said, okay, this is the neighborhood we want. We met with our mortgage lender. This is how much we can afford. Here's our price range. You got a great realtor and you started looking at houses. And maybe you went out for three or four weekends in a row and you saw dozens of houses. At that moment in time, you had your thumb right on the pulse of that market. You knew it probably better than most realtors in that market because in that sub-market, you looked at every house. You knew exactly what they were selling for. Now, today... A year or five years or 10 years later, you're probably not as close to the pulse as you were, but you were for that period of time. So the point is, as a real estate investor, you're going to be always paying attention to some of the macro stuff and certainly always paying attention to what your local boots on the ground team has to say. But you're going to really pay attention when it when it matters to you, when you either have to refinance or you're thinking about selling or buying a property. Well, and if you're an active investor, it matters all the time, because if you're not selling, you're buying. And that's always, you know, you have to be looking at your inventory. You have to be looking at your portfolio. Is it time to take equity off the table? Is it time to sell? Is it time to cash out, refinance, reposition equity? Is my market downtrending? Do I want to lock in long-term financing and make sure I can ride out another market cycle? Uh, Am I ready to completely move out of this market? Do I feel like it's run its course and I have better opportunities elsewhere? So it's constant. The other thing is you can't pay attention to, you know, 20 different markets. It's just not humanly possible. So better to, you know, learn how to filter and and pick a few markets that you're going to pay closer attention to and develop those great relationships. I think the biggest thing for me in, in closing today that I'd like to get across to everybody is just the idea that you do have to wrestle with this a little bit. You read these headlines And I know we all have ADD and we like to skip from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. And uh, we have a friend who says, uh, actually, I think it's a famous quote, thinking is hard work, which is why so few people do it. I think it was Mark Twain. But whoever said it, it's true. You really do have to discipline yourself to, to spend time to think. And the best way to do that is to engage in conversations with other people that are like-minded, that are studying the data and processing and process together. That's why the summit is so fabulous. That's why we're big on attending live events or joining meetup groups, doing whatever you got to do to get around other people who are into it like you're into it. Of course, listening to shows like this gives you things to kind of prime the pump, the conversational pump. But the news is also a great source. I learn a ton just by reading the news and then really reading the news and then asking 
asking myself, what's it saying? And where's the person who's writing it coming from? Where did they get the data? And then going back and looking at the original report. And is it is it time consuming? A little bit, yeah. But I mean, if you're a professional, if you're serious about what you do, uh, that's again, why you can't do every single market. But when you get good at asking great questions, then you will get good at finding great answers. And when you have great answers, great inputs to your decision-making process, by and large, you'll find yourself making better decisions, especially when you have a mastermind group of people that you can bounce those ideas off of. Don't be afraid of sharing your great ideas with other people because uh, that's the trade you get for getting their great ideas. And my experience in life has been, I usually get the better end of that deal. (laughs) I I get much better ideas than I give. And uh, along the way, I collect a whole bunch of good ideas myself. So I encourage you to to take on that practice. And the news is a great stimulus because the news puts whatever's going on in the world at the top of everybody's mind. So you can go have those conversations uh, with the people who are right around you all the time and quickly find out who's really thinking, who's paying attention, who's going to be interesting to be part of your mastermind group. So don't get overwhelmed by the metrics. Just pay attention to them. Get a sense of it. The great news is real estate markets tend to move a lot slower than other markets move. So you can be paying attention and at the same time, deciding what to do next, which is probably the most important thing to decide. Hey, next week on the show, we've got another awesome show. Until then, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at beyourbank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers, low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888-489-7723, extension 4. Or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.